from early childhood, I've been interested in who are we and who do we think we are and why do we tend to believe what we think. And that's what led me ultimately to become a Buddhist and a Buddhist priest. And I was trying to figure all that out uh, when I got to know Mai. And I had begun my investigation after growing up because of a man I was in love with who wanted to become an actor. I began to be intrigued by what happened when actors and actresses took on a role and <clears throat> invested or brought out of themselves certain aspects to play a part. And when I met Mai, I could see that everything that she hoped to do because she'd played this role before um, was threatened because the director wanted to do something psychological. And we're talking about Hedda Gabler. And we're talking about Hedda Gabler. In New York. Which she had played in Europe. Absolutely. And she knew the play well. So she was doing something professional. And he was undermining that and undermining everything she thought she could do. As an actor? Yes. As a professional and as somebody with a mind. Um, and so I thought, I've got to do something to help her. We had a mutual friend called Nora Sayre, whose father, Joel Sayre, I think, was blacklisted as a communist and lived in London. And Nora met Mai there. And when Mai came to New York to play in Hedda Gabler, um, she, she had what I now see was a breakdown. And Nora said, could you take her in? And I was living in my mother's apartment, which had an extra room. My mother was very rarely there. I and my boyfriend couldn't decide whether we were going to move in together. So there I was, and I was working at the Museum of Modern Art. And I sort of thought instinctively the thing to do with Mai was to ground her. So what I did was to teach her cooking. I said to her that I really loved, in the city, being in touch with things from the earth, plants that we eat. So we made these meals, which she really loved to eat. And that helped her enormously. Um, that was how we began. And then she talked and talked and talked and cried and cried and cried. And then eventually David came to take her home. And I don't know, you, you probably have the same experiences. Sometimes you meet someone <clears throat> and you know you'll always know them. And that was true particularly of David and Louis. Uh, I mean, Louis, absolutely, I knew him. I would know him for the rest of my life. But David, in a sense, also, partly because of his, the way he cared for Mai, which was wonderful, but not terribly good for him. And eventually, Mai had the extraordinary courage 
to tell him he had to leave her because she was living in they were living in France and he was everything that he could produce as a writer was British so they parted though eventually they admitted that their love was their great love but he she had not wanted to have children with him and he wanted children and she had i think three abortions without telling him and though he discovered that he was very upset by it I see. um so he did have children and I think Elizabeth was, was wonderful for him. I think it reflected on what she had done, that, that she hadn't wanted children. I think she wanted to work. Yeah. And <clears throat> David was the caring parent to Louis, I think. And I think Mai had real trouble with Etienne, or Etel, or whichever you call her. Her daughter. Yes. Um, so that was, that was a really big issue. But altogether, my had would get upset if she, my had a certain type of intelligence that was not intellectual book learning and david went to oxford and michael hurd went to oxford and sometimes the two of them would get into tedious british oxford you know chat which they sort of put down people, and it was flighty words. And Mai felt very left out. So I kept saying to her, you have a very different kind of knowledge. You are intuitive. David is not. He wishes that he were. Don't worry about it. It's different. But this is very hard to accept if you have struggled to learn things on your own. She used to uh, not go to school and pretend she was sick or she just wouldn't show up. And she would memorize names of plants. She was obsessed by names of plants and gardening. As a young child. As a young child. And so she would show this off and it was absolutely amazing, but it was so very narrow focus. Um, and that was scorned by Michael and David, who thought it was absurd. Yes, she left school at 13. Yes. And yet she had, when, when we looked at her office at Le Mazel, uh, she had hundreds and hundreds of books, all of which appeared to have been read by her. So she was Absolutely. Self-educated. Totally. But you think she had a complex about not having been formally educated. That's right. And I think that the way she read Nietzsche and people like that was her own way. It wasn't necessarily what somebody in college would do. Think. It wasn't guided by... It wasn't teachers. guided, that's right. Mm -hmm. But why should it be, is my opinion. <laughs> it's only one way. <laughs> Can you tell us um, in more detail uh, your first encounter with her? Uh, yes, she... Specifically when she, when she uh, was in New York and then went back and then asked you to come over to work on a film with her. When I first met her, she was sitting 
with her toes turned in, sort of looking down and she was totally lonely and bereft. Um, and she needed help. And, you know, I, I just offered unconditional friendship. Uh, and in some way, I became somebody that she, from then on, relied on. She would phone or we would write, or she would write letters once a week, or she would phone endlessly when we weren't together. And I, uh, I was happy to hear her voice and I cared about her, but it was as if it was, she needed the, the uh, approval or support or something like that. Um, you were interested in learning about filmmaking yourself. Yes, but um, not really seriously. I liked, I liked films. I still like films. I don't like many of them now, but that's right. When she, when she took on the role of, uh, in Hedda Gabler in New York, she had already made or was into her five-year plan of making films exactly and teaching herself exactly uh, to be a director yes and a, you know learning all the other aspects of film besides exactly just acting and uh but she took the role because she wanted the money basically she wanted the money and uh do you think that had anything to do with why she had such a difficult time with the role. When you first met her, was, did she talk a lot about making films herself? She, than... yes, and she hoped, I mean, I think it was off-Broadway. Yes. And she hoped it would be New York and something bigger than it was obviously going to be. Maybe because she didn't really know New York. Or maybe because she had been persuaded that it would be moved from off-Broadway onto Broadway. I don't know. I doubt it, but maybe. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> and and she you, said... Did you agree immediately? Oh, or? yes. And she said... Uh, she made an enormous mistake with the press in Iceland because they misunderstood her. <coughs> she said, here you are where time grows wild and you don't use it. And <coughs> she meant T-H-Y-M-E. But I wanted to go to Iceland because my dad, whom I lost when I was very young, loved Iceland mm -hmm. and loved William Morris, who was a designer, arts and crafts designer. And so I wanted to go to Iceland. So of course I wanted to go. And you were there for a month. Uh... Yes. And I, out and planning the film before the yes, mm -hmm. and she behaved in the, in the most to me bizarre manner, because she insisted that we sleep in a bed if we went to a cheap hotel, with my feet next to her head, and her feet next to my head, to save money, and so I would wait till she f fell asleep, and then I'd get on the floor because I was so afraid of hitting her. Yeah. 
uh, the Jeep <coughs> broke down that the uh, Icelanders had provided. And they went, they walked off to get parts or something. And they told us to collect dung, to make a big pile of dung, and either to get under it to stay warm, there were a lot of sheep or horses around, or else to start a fire. So we did. <laughs> and this was a very remote part of the terrain there. Was it, it was, yet yeah, the middle of nowhere. <coughs> that was before they had a road all the way around the country, and it was before they had a road through the country. I've been back five times since then. But then it was really, there was a lot of ice. And the lava was, there were no roads on it. Mm -hmm. I got to know so many people, like Gunnar Björnstrand and Eva Dahlbeck and Inga and um, Anita Björk. Out of some kind. Yes, she was struck by lightning or nearby twice. Really? There and in Iceland. Really? Outside a church when she said something about how she didn't believe in God. And she <laughs> stomped her foot down and there was this <laughs> spout of water or something and this sort of scene of trembling of earth. <laughs> and, um, that sort of confirmed her opinion. I thought it was very funny. <laughs> So right as she declared that she didn't believe in God, she That's was right. struck by lightning. Yes. <laughs> well, um, Joe Banerham also mentioned that at one point in, later in the 70s, everywhere she went, fires started. <laughs> she, she had poltergeists. She caused poltergeists. at Barry Grove. Um, curtains being pulled back and forth and things falling off tables and very strange. So she witnessed these things or do you think Other people saw them. Other people saw them. Yes. And she was credited with causing it or blaming Well who else would have Did you ever have any personal experiences of this paranormal? Yes, absolutely. Appearance? Also, she was very psychic, and she was very pleased by being very psychic. When I lived in London, she would telepathically send me a list of what she wanted me to bring on the weekend if I was going to stay at Berry Grove. You know, two pounds of Wensleydale cheese and something else, and then she'd see if I got it all right. And you, but you but see. David and I became great buddies, and we would make jokes. We were always making jokes, waiting around. And he took a lot of the still photographs. Uh huh. Yes, we saw those. And he was very sloppy with the cameras, which I thought was terrible because they were expensive cameras. I would have given my eye teeth for them, but anyway, he took some good pictures. And she needed his support. So did you move there, basically, and uh, stay with them, tutor the children, I think so? Yes, I tutored Louis. Louis really needed help. 
and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do in my life. Expressed an interest in... Oh, she did, ultimately. But she liked the drama. For example, she liked the drama of Tibetan Buddhism with gods and incense and gongs and bells and... Um, the pomp and circumstance. That's right. Costumes. But otherwise, not the... Yeah, the slog of work. I mean, you've got to focus your mind. You know, Mai was a doer, not, not a contemplative. I think she really just wanted equality. Um, that women be valued in a certain way that she felt women weren't. She and, also said that she didn't think all women were automatically cut out for motherhood. Correct. I would include her. Did she think that women weren't valued as women or that they were shut out of a man's world? Both. Both. How do you suppose she came up with this herself uh, prior to there being any formal political movement? Right? She obviously did. I think she felt it. How many other women directors were there? Not many. Not many. How many other women artists were valued? So she felt it as a result of her ambitions not having an environment to grow in. Not only ambitions, but just identity. And I think it, I think it sort of blurred into the aspect of war because she, I think, felt that women wouldn't start wars in the same way. So she would have thought, had women more power, we would have less... Conflict. Yes, yes. But she was uh, she was involved in uh, the committee for nuclear disarmament early in the fifties. That's right. Oh, she'd have, there'd be a discussion at the dinner table and David and Michael would go off on a tangent and she would storm out of the room because they wouldn't listen to her or she didn't like what they were saying. So she was more passionate about... Incredibly passionate. These issues. Incredibly. About. And not that articulate. I mean, at at home. Although she was very articulate in her yes works in her that's right works that's right. She was very articulate about emotions and yes, but I think that um, that David and Michael or Alec Guinness and other people who came over. Um, I think she got frustrated by them. Because they were too intellectual or? Um, because of how they, they approached a subject. Do 
Did you know uh, the Stewarts? I met them, but I didn't really know them. Her uh, liaison with Donald Stewart Jr. was long over when you met her. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Although she mentions that in her book as being an important... I think it was. <laughs> so when you met her in the 60s, in 1960, she was just uh, not too long past her affair with Tyrone Power. Is that right? That's right. Some people have told us that was a great love of her life, too. Do you think that's the case, or was that a professional? Uh, oh, no, it was, a, it was a love. It was a real love. But they did not keep in touch, did they? No. Yeah. And I don't know why. You said that uh, you thought, in terms of her relationship with data that she always used someone like a shield in front of her. I think so. And what, what do you mean by that? How... I think she relied on somebody, particularly a man, to uh, back her up. Because there was a part of her that was unsure, or there was a part that was simply emotional. Do you think part of it was because she had dealings in a man's world all the time, being a director? Yes. And maybe the man who she was using as a shield might give her a better entree into her, that world? Um. I think she just loved having a man around. There were some pictures of her when she was quite little, sort of standing tentatively behind a girl, as if that girl was also protecting her. A much stronger girl. So there was this, a sort of shy side of her. I don't know if you know the French word farouche, sort of uh, wild. It was a wild, wild side. Related to feral. Yes, that's right. Uh, untamed. That's my in Iceland. Yeah, this is my in Iceland with the sheep. And this is... Louis. Louis. So you tutored him between the age of 12 and 18, like that? Yeah. And this is quite... Uh, That's not long before not she long died. before she passed away. Can you tell us uh, about... She wore white all the time. That's the crew in Iceland. And Chris Menges is there somewhere. So you were on horseback in Iceland a lot, huh? Yes, there's Chris. Uh -huh. And this is David. David. You've probably seen this, but I thought if you hadn't, you should look at it. We have. This is a very typical picture that I took of, of my found a thistle out in the country. And so we had to protect the thistle. So the umbrella was being held over the thistle. <laughs> You were protecting it from the elements. The elements, okay. <laughs> While it was dug up to be taken to the garden. <laughs> you can have those pictures. I don't, you know, if you'd like them. A film 
I think it, what interest, one of the things that interested her was the difference between shooting the film and editing it and where you would put the emphasis. How much extra footage do you have? And uh, how close can you get to what you really want? To minimize the editing. editing. That's right. She didn't overshoot. She didn't. I don't think. I don't know. I don't know. She tried not to. Looking for in advance. Yes. And I think she thought of the angles a lot. I think she thought visually. I think I remember sometimes that she would make drawings of of a setup or a tracking shot or something. But I think maybe quite a few d directors do that. Yes, of course. When you were in Iceland uh, for a month prior to the crew coming, is that what you did? You you looked at absolutely, and there was there was the real issue of scale there, because Myers was short, and the trees were all stunted, and <laughs> the houses were low in the middle of the country. So how do you say how far away anything is? It's very hard to tell. It wasn't a conventional perspective. Not at the all. Or, you know, the horses are ponies. They're short. <laughs> uh -huh. So she had to compensate for this yes. sizing. Yes, and she enjoyed thinking about that. What about color? Do you recall anything when, when she started working in color? I guess uh -huh. that wasn't until the early 70s. No, that, that was later. <coughs> I think she loved color. Except for orange and red. Except for <laughs> orange and red. <laughs> Free association. Then you will really see what David had to cope with when he rewrote everything she wrote. Because if you think that she wrote things and that's what she wrote, what you read in a behind between covers of a book, what she wrote is a stream of words. And he was basically her editor. Totally. In the novels. Totally. The two novels. That's right. Novels, actually. That's Night right. Games, Bird of Passage. Yes. The Shadow of the Sun. Well, those are, that's a series of short stories, actually. Yes. And so he was, we've heard this from others, that, that he was her editor early on. Although, when we were at the Swedish Film Institute studying her later writing. Oh, she was clearer then. She had right, she had developed those skills of editing herself. A lot more. I think, yeah. So it could be that due to her lack of formal education, her work with David, with him as her editor, was sort of her own formal education and learning how to write more clearly. And I think and that stuff. her mind got ahead of her words. When she was younger, yeah. Or tended to. Mm-hmm. I see. She, he was a friend of hers, though. Yes. And then there was our pad, whom I don't think you Yeah, I was just met. telling the others here that you had mentioned uh, that they were close, and I believe I've located his son. Ah. Roland. Yeah. So, okay. Arpad was the person she turned to for financial help. This is Arpad Rosner. That's right. right. And he was an accountant, yes? He was an accountant. Yeah. He did her taxes. He did her taxes. Yeah. Poor fellow. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, I, th I, th I think she was profligate and sort of, I think she, if she had money, she spent it. Well, the world is made up of two different kinds.
kinds of people, those who spend and those who save. Yes, yes. that's right. And why not get the best wine? And where did she get these ideas, do you think? She grew up quite poverty-stricken. I think she loved the good life. Uh-huh. And I think people like Tyrone Power showed it to her. So she got a taste of it and wanted to continue. Yes. I mean, Inga and Anita, by comparison, are sort of very mild living. If Inga has a glass of wine, it's remarkable. <laughs> but Mai would buy the expensive, the expensive bottle and drink it, isn't it? She'd buy a dozen or two dozen at a time. And then have a party. And then have a party. <laughs> There was a gender issue with Michael because he was gay and he hid it because he thought in those days it shouldn't be talked about. And he lived a very closed in life thinking about Lord Nelson and the Battle of Trafalgar and things like that. He had a lot of mementos in his little cottage. And it was so, in a way, precious. And Mai wanted to get him out of there and expand the way he composed and uh, live life fully and enjoy good food. And because he would have, if you stayed with Michael, which I did a couple of times, um, you were supposed to make your bed as soon as you got up. And it had to be, you know, really smooth. And then go downstairs. And then you'd have breakfast and then you'd do, everything was ordered. And my wanted him to get rid of all of that. <laughs> was that her usual approach to people? Yes, yes, yes. She liked a little disarray? <laughs> yes. And then there were people like Alec Guinness who converted to Catholicism. And so he sent a card at Christmas to say he wasn't sending a Christmas card because he was donating the money he would have spent to some good cause. And my blew her stack. and got after him about it. Because? Because it was absurd. That he would give to a charity? Oh, n no, that he was sending a card, saying he wasn't going to send a card. Oh, I see, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a little bit of unpredictability. In Absolutely. Him. Didn't like to be bored. Did she manage not to be bored? Oh, if she, if she was upset by something. <coughs> we went to a concert and there was a piece by Brahms and it moved her too much. She said, we've got to leave. This is too much for me. So we all had to go. <laughs> uh, quickly. Oh, very strong feelings about things, including art. Yeah. But that was about him more than about his art, they in a way. Indeed, yes. Or who she thought him to be. That's right. She said, she quotes in the in her autobiography at the beginning of the chapter uh, that um, what a terrible thing to be an artist or some such that Van Gogh said. Um, 
Van Gogh's letters are very moving. And I think she really loved them. She, she seems to, well, she writes a lot about the suffering, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly after she left David or sent David away, as you put it. Uh, and her film Amorosa, based on the Agnes von and Sharon yes. novels, depict a lot, a terrible lot of suffering, um, mental and emotional suffering. She explores this aspect of personality quite deeply. What, what she got that? more and more into some sense of what inner turmoil was. And in a sense, it seems to me, she acted it out in order to feel, to feel it more clearly. That's how she got in touch with it. And so you think that she, she had these emotions herself. Yes. She felt, uh, emotionally, mentally unstable herself, and that's why she included the, these themes in her art? Ultimately, ultimately. I think, uh, because insanity, madness, it is a, a dominant theme in her work. It's one dominant theme. Yes, it is. And you think that, uh, and yet she, she just seems so practical and grounded uh, herself that... I don't think she was totally. No. And I don't know, that's a hunch. I mean, the person that I saw at first certainly was totally beside herself. And I think that could overcome her at almost any moment. I saw the man who was, whom she had been told was her father, but wasn't her father. Oh, Zetterling. Joel Zetterling. Yes. The one she basically grew up with. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I saw some other man too, but I can't remember who he was. Her mother, uh, after Joel Zetterling, had another uh, That's right. man in her life who other people have mentioned, although we don't remember his name. But he was later, after Maya was an adult. That's right. So you did meet Joel Zetterling. What was your impression of him? I'm not sure. He might have been older when you met him, is that right? Yes. Did she speak about him? Or? I don't remember. <sighs> A long time ago. But she spoke about her mother. Yes. With not much fondness. Really? But she was an only child, basically, in growing up. Except she discovered that she had a half-brother. Or half-sister, half-brother? Half-sister. Half-sister who was married to a policeman, and that thrilled her, because this it was... This was her mother's daughter. This was her mother's daughter. Right. And this is the one she discovered when her mother passed away? Yes, and she said she hoped that she would find she had a brother also. Maybe there was another. <laughs> and the only time I went against my was when I told Louis that he really should meet his father and see what he was like, because otherwise he, he would, it would either be a mystery or he would accept what might not be true at all. And Louis was very concerned because he had a sister who was 
mentally troubled. So he, he, he got to know them, and that was very good. He got to know his uncle and other people. Yeah, the lamb cows were brothers. They're, they're, yes. That's how she, the, the Tutti and his, there were two brothers or two. one? I thought there were two. There were two, okay. So he stayed basically in touch with his... Absolutely, brother. and they, I don't know, was it their parents or were they part of a Ukrainian singing, dancing team. The aspect of Ukraine in that in those lives is quite amazing to me. Tute and his family were Ukrainian. Jews yes, that escaped Norway. Is that right? Yes. I see. And it turned out that Mai was part Ukrainian. It's on her mother's. Side. Yes. which explains why, in some ways, she didn't really look Swedish. And, uh, yeah, I mean... Or oh, stereotypically Swedish. Right, right. Her biological father was Swedish, but yes. her mother was of Ukrainian heritage. Yes. She, you said she, there was a commentator named... Muggeridge. Muggeridge, and she called him Buggeridge? She called him Vacuum Buggeridge. <laughs> but she watched him every evening anyway. That's right. She, did she stay up on current events? Yes. Yeah, just one last. What about literature, music? Any, you remember any specific? passions that she had in those areas? Uh, well, we had disagreements on the subject of playing religious music while you cook and do other things, but that's my problem. And when you say disagreements, she wanted to play religious yes, music? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> when you say religious music, you mean... Masses. Masses. Yes. She liked high church masses. Yes, but she didn't particularly like Bach. She liked more um, Bieber and people that one doesn't really think about a lot who were Baroque. Um, oh, Michael would have been better at telling you about music. She did like a lot of classical music. Yes, she did. Absolutely. And did you find that she studied classical music as much as, you know? No. Was, no, she just... No. But we, we've also been told that she liked some popular music. Yes. And I bought Louis lots and lots of classical music. Um... And I would drive him to get um, reeds for his, was it a flute, flute, no, oboe, clarinet. clarinet, or whatever, can't remember. So he did play? Yes, he did. Did she play an instrument? No. Yeah, not at all? No. Or sing? Oh, she could sing. Yes. <laughs> and David played piano? David played the piano. And the, uh, at the end of her life, she asked to hear, was it Schubert? I think it was Schubert. Yeah. She also liked madrigals, it says in her autobiography. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. I hadn't thought of it. Yes, it's true. Mm -hmm. So she liked voices. She liked voices. And harmony. Yes. And she's always got brass bands in her movies. That's right. <laughs> a little militant something or other. Yeah, a lot of militant music in the short called The, the Strongest. That's right. 
in Visions of Eight. That's right. And also in uh, Strong Rhythm. Yeah, and also in The Girls. Yes. And also in We Have Many Names. Are you familiar with that feature? Though? No. That she made in 1977. No. That's a very interesting. But in most of her films, she had a brass band or orchestra. Yes, and I think that was to insist on her point. It was like sort of emphasizing her message. You think? So I, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's true. She thought that the music, you know, that, this is people's the, attention. Yeah, this is it. Attention. This is it. I see. So I'm delivering the message now, and here's that's the, right. Here's the music to announce it and back it. That's up. right. 